cool. This is a very cozy room with a <laughs> very cozy group of people. Uh, cool. So today I'm going to talk about uh, release best practices. So this is kind of like hard earned um, experience I've got over the years. Uh, like n number of times when I had to wake up in the middle of the night trying to troubleshoot things and uh, from there that you learn how not to do things. So I'll try to condense it down to this presentation. Hopefully it will, it will help you guys in your future career or actually right now if you're uh, handling some internship or any other kind of uh, deployment. Right, so a little bit about me, it's already uh, uh, introduced. So uh, I basically a software engineer and data engineer at Facebook for Singapore for a couple of years. And then uh, earlier this year, I moved to a startup world again. Um, so I graduated from com computer science uh, NUS back in 2015, uh, early 2016. Sweet, all right, so, um, oh, a little bit about business AI. <laughs> I uh, uh, compulsory to do this. So. Uh, we're doing ML deployment uh, platform for enterprises, uh, and we're hiring. So uh, Herbert here is also our intern uh, last summer. So if any of you want to know what, how it's work uh, at Basis AI, just ask him. Uh, he will give better accounts than me. All right, so uh, compulsory memes. <laughs> One does not simply release code on a Friday. So why do we, why do we not do that? Right? Because <laughs> obviously you want Saturday and Sunday to yourself. You don't want to wake up and like try to troubleshoot, oh, what's happening with the database? What's happening with the re latest release of the code? So it's, uh, it's a meme, but it's real. <laughs> so keep this in mind. Th if there's only one thing that you take away from this talk, this. <laughs> so what is a release? Uh, so basically, you apply uh, changes to your production environment. All right, production environment is in code change, database, schema change, whatever that is. Uh, so in short, it will be the first time your user actually used something that you have been cooking, right? So this, can I have a very small show of hands who have like deployed something? So as in, there there be real users who are not your friends, who are not yourself, <laughs> but like complete strangers. So there's a few a few people, I guess. All right, cool. So that's that's basically how you feel, right? Like you, you that you just like release your puppy to the world and then. Oh, hopefully nobody mess it up. Uh, so why is it important? So if you break the application, obviously there will be the downtime and you disappoint a lot of people, your friend, yourself, and your users. Uh, so let's try not to do that. Someone has to fix it when you break it, right? Like you, yourself, your team, your boss, whoever that is, and at any time. Because it's not good to have any downtime at all. So. 3 p.m. or 3 a.m., then you have to wake up to fix it. Um, so going to now, what are the very rule of thumb of releases? So why, why do I start with this? Because the actual act of releasing something, it's very simple. Most of the time, you just you click in buttons. That's it. You click a deploy button, and then that it will change into make the change into production area, and then that's it. So in, in this. A very small particular case. There's just a few things you need to worry about. First of all, don't release on a Friday. <laughs> I hate repeating myself, but this is true. Or for uh, all practical purposes, don't release at any time when you are about to go on leave or anything. If you don't want to touch work at all, then don't do it. Second of all, plan to be around for at least one hour. So if anything cooks up after the, the release, then you are there to fix it because you have the most context, right? And third of all, let people know. Let the team know, hey, I'm doing this. If not, then <laughs> too bad. You're the only one on the hook. Cool. So with that out of the way, so the keys to a safe release, aside from that just very opportunistic kind of action, is all the planning that comes before that. So it has a lot more to do with how you do the development yourself, right? How do you uh, think of backwards and forwards compatibility because uh, breakage happens when either of them don't work. So there are a few types of change when it comes to production release. Uh, either you do a code change, oftentimes code change is stateless, as in you can, it's just a binary, you switch one version for another and sh it's just still uh, not too much of a problem. The second one, more complicated, is when there's data related change, when there is like data schema change or some, if you're like a schema, schema-less uh, database, then there'll be data format change. If you change the log format, 
to, uh, from one column name to another or one field name to another. You can crash someone else's dashboards and like, monitoring will trip you up. Uh, and third time is config change. You change your web server, you change your load balancer config, you change your C name, and then oh, all of a sudden you can access the site anymore. So those are the three main types of change. Um, and uh, within the context of this talk, I focus more on the backend and web releases because mobile uh, releases are very different. Uh, anyone want to take a wild guess why mobile different is different from web and backend? Reviews. Yes, reviews. So if you want to release the App Store, there will be an additional step for you to release it. It's not like you just click a button and then it goes out. So uh, to keep uh, the focus of this talk, let's think about backend and web only. So those are the more manageable ones, and people tend to have developed good practice around it. So the first type, code changes. So um, before you do anything about code changes, uh, try to think of continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this thing is actually just kind of a pipeline, and you get a lot out of it. If you don't have any other type tooling yet, this is the first thing you should do. So there are a lot of uh, things out there that, that are already um, off the shelf that you can use. There are Jenkins, Travis, Circle CI, Team CD. Basically, you visit any of the more proper GitHub repository, then you will see a batch of any of those things. Uh, have a check. If it's not a check, if it's a red or something, then probably don't use it, that. Um, so the idea around this continuous integration and delivery is just uh, from your ch code changes, uh, you make one liner, two liner change, or whatever, and then you, before you try to merge it into your master branch, it runs through a whole bunch of automated uh, testing, uh, automated uh, like deployment even. Uh, so these, all of this infrastructure is already to make sure that your changes before being merged in uh, is already uh, like somehow is already vetted. Uh, so your merge is safe. So um, I, I will not talk m too much more about continuous integration and delivery because there are a lot more informative uh, blog posts about it that you can search online. And, uh, let's just zoom past this, this point. Uh, there'll be Q&A towards the end. And uh, second type, uh, second trick that you can do for releases, it's what I call inserts two colors deployment because people call it various names, blue, green, red, black, whatever. The point is there are two versions of it. So when you make this one version with the new changes and there's the old version. So all you have to do is just, you bring up the new version with all these new things, uh, nice things that you've built uh, in the past couple of weeks. And then you just make changes to the load balancing uh, layer so that you can point all the traffic from the old version to the new version. That's basically the idea behind it. And there, there can be multiple levels of uh, configuration. There are some load balancing tools that you can direct like percentages of your traffic towards a new version. And there are others like you can just like flip a switch or something and it will revert everything to the new version. So like to, to expand on this idea, you can see that you can move traffic from uh, 0.1 to 0.5 to 1 to 2%, all this thing. So one of the story I had when I was working at Facebook was that, um, that for a site uh, that is for like billions of people, literally, um, you would have thought that they have very stringent process of like releasing whatsoever. Uh, but the, the thing is, you, uh, you'd be amazed that uh, all these tools uh, are built to automate the majority part of it. So if you make some changes, you merge it in, and literally hours later, it'll reach the mil billions of people out there. It's because of these traffic moving uh, steps. So they release it in, in um, so-called circles, 0.1% um, of the traffic first. If the uh, monitoring tools don't trip up, then you increase it uh, gradually until 100% like of the traffic is using the new version of it. And um, now, this is purely kind of a technical thing, right? So like controlling traffic, diverting traffic, whatnot, or whatnot, is typically a job of a DevOps engineer or a software engineer. But uh, to expand on this, what if you can control the release that is completely different from the, uh, from, like, the business need of releasing a feature completely different from releasing of the code? Um, so the idea is that you ship the new version of the code, but you can dynamically toggling uh, your feature to be on or off. 
So you can target cert certain, uh, certain groups. Let's say if you release a new version, you want to target only the internal user first, only employees will be able to see the change. Uh, then you, you would release to that group of people first. Everything goes well, then you expand it to the rest of your company or the rest of the organization or target certain customers that you want to test out. So basically the idea is that you can decouple feature release from code release. So if you talk to non-technical people, they tend to get very excited about this. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind as well. And to, um, there, there are a few off-the-shelf versions that can a services that can provide you this, um, but actually building one yourself is quite interesting and it's not difficult at all. Uh, so you can kind of like research on, um, this is a very famous uh, person, Martin Fowler. He wrote like an entire piece about feature toggling. So that's something you can uh, look up on as well. So the third one uh, is API versioning. So let's say your code changes or whatnot they're all internal to your application. If uh, you change your backend and the only consumer is your front end, then probably uh, you can, even if you trip up something, it's still easy to just revert it because you control of both, right? Now it comes much tricky trickier when you have an API. And because when you have an API, then the consumer set is not only yourself anymore. There are other people who depends on a particular version of the API to work. So how do you try to guard against this? So you try to follow semantics versioning. So what semantics versioning try to do is just that if you have a way of naming your, uh, your, your versions right, then people kind of know what to expect out of it. So let's say if it's 1.0, then it kind of means that, hey, I'm ready, generally available. If it's 2.0, then it means, oh, I'm still ready, still generally available, but there are non-backwards compatible change as compared to my version one. Uh, so that actually is very helpful to me. Uh, let's say if you release version one and then you're not happy with the design or whatnot, uh, then you can build up your version two while at the same time maintain v V1 to work. Uh, and then after that, you press release or whatsoever to say that, hey, now we have V2, which is so much better. So why don't you guys move to there? Um, and basically just don't break the existing V1 API and create a new version instead. So let's say uh, V1, actually, there are a lot of times when V1 is due for deprecation. And this deprecation process takes months or even years. If you look into Facebook Graph API, for example, the first version of it, I believe from the moment it was released until it was fully deprecated, it took like five years. And the larger part of, that, of those five years is spent in deprecation mode. So if you trigger any of the call to uh, those APIs, then it actu actually returns you some sort of warnings that, hey, you shouldn't do that. And then people uh, and Facebook send you an email saying that, hey, you shouldn't trigger this endpoint anymore. And the very important part if you want to do API versioning is that you have to have some sort of uh, tracking, some sort of metrics to say that, hey, how many people are still using my old API version? If not, then you don't know when is the safe time to kind of like cut off and okay, now we can just delete all those V1 API anymore. So the third point is, is very important for this. Right, so after all the code changes, they're more or less like binary. You can just switch between version. If it's, if it's too much of a trouble, uh, if it breaks something, it's like, okay, just revert. It's no big deal, right? But what if it's a database-related change? So database-related is much more, uh, much more trickier because, first of all, they the, for database, rolling back is actually much, much harder. And uh, if you trip up something with a database, you might lead to permanent data loss. So there is this incident about GitLab happened like about two, three years ago. And it was quite uh, a hoo-ha at the time because they lost data for like six hours. Uh, and somehow, eventually, they, got, they managed to recover from it. But imagine if you do something and then you don't have proper backup, then that six hours worth of data will be gone forever. There's no way in hell you're gonna be able to recover from it. So for database changes, there are a few things that we can try to uh, look into it. All right, so first of all, make sure you have backups, right? So if you, most of the time, you would use a cloud provider's uh, uh, database uh, service 
So they already have uh, various built-in kind of uh, backups mechanism, uh, is either like every hour, every day, or like some trigger, uh, a lot of APIs you can trigger it, and then uh, it will do a backup for you, so you don't have to worry too much about the logistics of, of backing up things. And generally, they tend to be pretty, uh, pretty good with recovering as well. You don't have to worry too much about the integrity of the database um, backup that, that like GCP or AWS created for you. Um, then, <coughs> but still, it's a good idea to, like every now and then, test your backups to make sure that, hey, this thing works. If not, you're just backing up junks and like the moment you need it, it's like, oh shit, it doesn't work. Um, and then the third, the third thing, after you have all your backup, all the, your backups are, are tested already, then you still have to worry about uh, backwards and forwards compatibility. Like, uh, so what it has to do with, with database is that, let's imagine you change uh, a column name. How do you make this change safely? because there are various parts where it can fail, right? You can start writing to the new column, although your schema hasn't changed. You can still read from the old column while your schema has already dropped this change. Or like how do you, inter in, what's the interplay between the code and the database schema? So one, one thing, the code is stateless while the, the database itself is stateful. So this thing uh, is, is a well-covered topic so Stripe Engineering actually have a very good uh, tutorial kind of about how you can how you can do this, and I'll just write out the steps here because they, they are very common and uh, it's not that uh, difficult to follow at all. First of all, try to double write. So if you create a new, uh, you want to rename a column, you create the new column and then you write it to both the old and the new version of that column, so that you still maintain the data integrity parallel in parallel. After that, then, then you can run data migration. You can copy whatever of the old column over to the new column. So you make sure that from there on, all of your new, uh, your new column have the full data set from the history as well as the present and as well as your future, because it's already writing uh, to the new column. Then after that, the third thing, you can remove the read part of your old column. So uh, now because you already have it in the new column, you don't need to read from the old anymore. Uh, and eventually, you're going to remove the write from the old column as well. After all these four steps are done, then your interaction between your code and the old column has already disappeared. Then you can safely drop that uh, column or even table or whatsoever. So it's kind of like a five-step five thing. And uh, it's um, if you visit the, the link that I have here, it's actually a lot more interactive. People spend time, did animations and whatnot, which is better than what I'm, I'm trying to do here. So I recommend highly uh, read that blog post from uh, Stripe Engineering. Right, so the third type of change that usually has to do with deployment is config changes. So config change like web server change, or load balancer, or whatever else that doesn't get captured in the database or get captured in your code. So um, a very famous incident just a few months earlier in March, Facebook had about 14 hours of downtime, partial downtime, like images or whatnot couldn't load at all. Uh, and the reason happening was there were some config changes that made it to the entire fleet of Facebook server, and then it just stopped working. And if I'm not wrong, it, was, it happened by some uh, intern so, so if you uh, if you keep that in mind, then you would not uh, bolster the stereotypes of of, of intern season anymore. So uh, just just keep keep that in mind, right? So the first thing about config change, don't don't just once one off and release it to the entire fleet of your server. Gradual rollout. By gradual rollout, I mean choose a specific group of servers or targets you want to make changes to. Um, make changes there first, and then observe how they behave after that. If all goes well, then you can release it to a larger group, kind of like similar to how the code changes uh, I suggested earlier. Um, another thing is you can consider um, some key value store. There are various ones that are pretty good, like Consul or Zookeeper. So those key value store basically can host your configuration as well. And they tend to have uh, good 
either backup or uh, um, edit uh, mechanism built in. So let's say if you change something and then it doesn't work, you can revert to the old version pretty easily. Um, and then the third thing is version your config. So let's say if you, you add another uh, row or you change another config uh, values, um, just create a different version for it altogether and name it like v1 and v2. So later on, if v2 doesn't work out well, just revert to v1. Kind of like make it instead of a, uh, a config change, convert that into a code change. So that's the idea behind kind of like infrastructure as code as well. Before that, everything is kind of ephemeral and like states are everywhere. There's no good way to track it. Now people say that, hey, you should track all your configuration or your infrastructure in version control as well. So the config changes, the, deal, the trick about dealing with it is actually try to convert them into code changes and that will be better for everyone. Yeah, but of course, don't commit your secrets, right? Database, password or whatnot, absolutely no. Uh, but other things, okay. Cool, so I try to wrap it up in very short amount of time. So now it's the Q and A. Um, if you have any questions about like releases, or what are some of the things that you have always wonder about in deployment? Um, just now you mentioned about load balancing, yep. where the percentage of the traffic is uh, gradually moved to the next, uh, the new server. Mm. What if, um, like, like if I'm at zero point five percent and then it crash, then what happens with like the percentage? Does it just go straight back to one like zero percent, or does it gradually decrease? Mm, so um, usually, if you have a, a mechanism to do this traffic moving, then there's some mechanism, uh, there's some manual uh, s mm, switch for you to turn the version immediately back. If you say there's like 0.5 percent and it's breaking things, right? Then usually some DevOps guy will press the button and then it will revert to entirely the old version. Yep. So it depends on the company or the practices as well, um, but. Um, most of the time, what I see is that they will revert the entire thing back to zero. Like immediately. Kind of, yeah. And it depends on your tools, but uh, that's what you should aim for. Are there like uh, a certain step you should follow when your server goes down? Like for example, when this server goes down, what are the things you go to check as part of your duties? Hmm, good question. So first of all, well, I. I'm, I'm not the infrastructure kind of guy. So like, uh, you know, like software engineer usually d don't like directly interact with the servers, right? Uh, usually there will be a DevOps team or infrastructure team or uh, production engineer teams that uh, focus on maintaining these, these server and the basics infrastructure like networks uh, whatsoever. So um, I, I'm, I might not be best posi position to do that uh, from my little experience dealing with, with that area though, the first thing you check is usually whether the node is up, like whether it's physically, you can like connect to it, you can check if like it's, uh, you can reach, it. is it reachable uh, via network, is, you can you SSH to it, what are the um, uh, ways that you can communicate with that server. Um, then after that, uh, but, but this, this is kind of in the old days where a server actually matters a lot. Uh, a lot nowadays, servers is kind of treated as ephemeral. You just migrate the workload somewhere else. Um, but uh, the first thing is just check for whether you can connect to the thing at all. Uh, second of all is look into your logs. Um, the logs means either it's a centralized logging or in sometimes you actually have to, uh, or after you connect it to the, 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 the server, then you look into their slash var uh, slash log and then certain services that you are interested in. And then from, you kind of like dig up from there. And uh, from, from there onwards, then it's very um, specific to your stack, uh, your application. So uh, from there on, it varies. Uh, your mileage is not guaranteed by any uh, sequences or anything. Um, there's actually a pretty good book from uh, Google's site, Reliably, uh, Reliability Engineering. Uh, it's, it's just uh, reliability engineering uh, something something. Uh, it's from, from the guys who maintain server farms and whatnot at Google uh, and maintain the basic infrastructure uh, as, I, as I mentioned. And um, a lot of good practices are actually in there. So if you're more interested in this area, um, I recommend go read that book instead.
A-B testing. Uh, so this actually has a lot more to do with this. Because um, A-B testing, essentially, you want to maintain two versions of your application at the same time, right? And uh, a lot of the time, you want to control the group that receive one type of treatment versus the other. Um, so like some sort of feature toggling, some sort of feature targeting is absolutely crucial. Uh, but uh, something that's very specific to A-B testing, though, is you have to make sure you measure um, your, uh, your success rate. Um, after you divide the group, then you have to have logging all sort of metrics data, and you pump it into your data warehouse and perform analysis to say that, hey, group A is better group B, um, or certain things like that. Um, so it's co closely related to it, but it has a lot more intricacy because you have to build your data infrastructure next to it. Um, so there, uh, I believe there are a lot of other literature that has to do with A-B testing. Um, so I might not be the best guy to answer this. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, of course. How do you verify that back up works? I mean, like, in the case, like, the famous, if I read correctly, like, the famous case of GitLab is that, you know, their servers go down, and then when they try the backup, then it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And, like, you know, and you, you obviously cannot just delete from this time, like, straight that the backup works. Yeah, so uh, spin up a different database, try to recover into that, and like just run SQL stuff on it, or if you best yet, if you have some um, uh, automated database testing, like the one you built for us, <laughs> <laughs> then that would be cool. Um, so yeah, um, again, I'm not a database administrator, so uh, there are uh, there, there are other best practices specific to like testing your backups and whatnot that I might not know about. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.